So today, I get the real pleasure of introducing this year's speaker, Dr. Daryl Kirch, who's our president and CEO of the AAMC. He told me to make this brief, so I'll try. <laughs> um, Dr. Kirch is a distinguished physician, educator, and medical scientist. He speaks and publishes widely on the need for transformation in the nation's health care system and how academic medicine can lead that change across medical education, biomedical research, and patient care. Prior to becoming AAMC president in 2006, Dr. Kirch served as dean and leader of academic health systems at two institutions, Penn State Hershey Medical, Men Hershey Medical Center and the Medical College of Georgia. He's a psychiatrist and uh, clinical neuroscientist by training, um, and he began his career at the National Institute of Mental Health, becoming the acting scientific director in 1993 and receiving the Outstanding Service Medal of the United States Public Health Service. A native of Denver, he earned both his bachelor's and medical degrees from the University of Colorado. In this leadership plenary address, he will make the case for the transformation of academic medicine and help us as GIA members to become a strategic partner in leading our institutions toward positive change. At the conclusion of his talk, we are going to open the floor um, for questions and answers, and it'll be a real treat because um, he is just a very genuine and thoughtful person when it comes to people just asking him questions and answering them off the cuff. So I give to you Dr. Kirch. Thank you so much. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to get comfortable and uh, I really encourage all of you to do the same. You want to be able to see the slides. My colleague Kelly Mann, who's joined me here, does a wonderful job in helping me put slides together that have some prospect of uh, breaking the tedium of my, my actually talking. The, and, you know, I do want to make this interactive, so I hope to leave plenty of time at the end uh, for discussion, not just Q&A, but to really wrestle with some of the issues that we struggle with. Uh, I, I unfortunately didn't see it, but some of you attended a master class yesterday morning by Allison Valancourt, I believe, from Arizona, in which they, she talked about change. And I read the summary, and it was interesting. I think she titled it, uh, The Old Guard Versus Damn the Torpedoes. And she illustrated how uh, we have people who uh, are fairly described as change-resistant, in our organizations, and we have people in academic medicine who say and write articles saying we should just blow it up. <clears throat> you know, there are so many problems, we should just clean the slate and start from scratch. I would argue that there's something in between that terrible uh, glacial incremental change that we've done so well <laughs> and, and blowing it up which would destroy so many good things that we built. And in my view, I like to use the term transformational change, big change that honors the great things we've done, but finally deals with the problems we have. So that's where I hope we go today. I, I'd be remiss, though, if I didn't congratulate you on, on your, uh, what is 50? Is that, that's the golden anniversary, right? Uh, on your golden anniversary. You were one of the first groups, and you were really part of our realization in academic medicine that, yes, you need a dean. The LCME requires one. But, but more and more, the real work is done by people who have very specialized roles and great content expertise, like you do in the various fields that GIA focuses upon. So for that, I know as a, as a former dean and now as AMC president, I, I echo what Steve Clasco said last night. When, when my colleagues in the dean's office sit back and think about it, we realize how fortunate we are to have you there. So you've been telling our stories for 50 years, but I think those stories are going to get harder to tell because of some challenges we face. And I think this is one of those moments in time when we need to pay attention to one of the many great points that Jim uh, Collins made in his book, Good to Great. 
probably virtually everybody in the room has read the book, and probably most of you remember he referred to Admiral Stockdale and what he called the Stockdale Paradox. Admiral Stockdale was the longest serving POW in Vietnam. Jim Collins had a chance to meet him and he said, how'd you do it? How did you make it through that experience? And th this is the quote he had, essentially saying that unless you're really honest with the facts, the realities that you face, combined with this enormous sense that you will prevail, you're not going to make it. It's the combination of squarely admitting to the reality, but feeling totally committed to your ability to prevail. If this is true, uh, I spend a fair amount of time on your campuses and with medical groups and others saying, what are the facts? Are we really being honest with ourselves now? Um, there's a reality that I think we spend way too little time talking about, which is the reality of our culture. Uh, I'm one of those people that believes that culture does eat strategy for lunch every day. And you can, have, you can have the glossiest, most beautiful strategic plan, but if your culture doesn't support it, nothing will really happen. Well, what is our culture? And I think there are three dimensions to our culture aligned with our missions we, we need to pay attention to. Now, here's a photo of me teaching a neuroscience lecture earlier in my life, <clears throat> pontificating, uh, illustrating the culture of education in general, higher education in general, which is, it's about me, the expert, right? The professor, source of all knowledge. You come, you know, sit at my feet and, and hopefully absorb some of my wisdom. Very expert-centric. Now that culture uh, uh, is not, I'm, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be tied to scholarship, we shouldn't be tied to universities. But I think we need to acknowledge that in higher education in general, the individualism is pervasive. And then in academic medicine, there are things that reinforce it. There's the culture of our research. You probably can't read the details, but this is a face page from a famous R01, an NIH grant. Well, an R01 is an individual investigator grant given to a person who's proven their independence. You see how that reinforces the expert centrism? In fact, if you could read the numbers down the side, it tells you what the direct costs are and the total cost. And every faculty member I've met feels that this is their money, the direct cost are their money, and you guys have been stealing the rest of it in the form of these indirect costs that evaporate into the vapor. But it's their grant and their effort, reinforcing that individualism. And then what do we do in health care? We pay individuals for piecework. So this is a hospital bill. Again, you don't need to read the numbers, but it just illustrates, you know. The anesthesiologist gets their fee. The radiologist gets their fee. The lab gets its fee per blood test. And it all adds up, ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching. And while there is a total bill, it's totally structured in fee-for-service medicine around individual effort. So the net result is I grew up in a world, I never thought about it, I never parsed what was going on, but I grew up in a world where these were the defining cultural elements. It was about what I achieved, how smart I became, how long my CV was, how independent I was, how I could pack up and threaten to leave any day and strike terror in the hearts of the people uh, who should have been frightened of losing my talent, competing with others on the promotion and tenure ladder. That culture is pervasive in higher education and it became pervasive in medical schools when they based themselves uh, tied themselves with universities after the Flexner report. And we could say, 
look, that's just the way universities are. You know, you talk with professors, you know the size of their egos. You should just say, they're, but they're smart people, they're doing wonderful things. Let's just accept it for what it is. But for academic medicine, it creates a special challenge, I would argue, for us because we're so deeply involved in healthcare. If you think about your university, does the law school run the largest law firm in the city? Does the business school control the, the uh, banking system in the city? But universities, by virtue of their medical schools and their affiliated teaching hospitals, are deeply involved in health care, which is the biggest sector in the American economy. So our hospitals, our teaching hospitals, owned and affiliated, are only 6% of the hospitals in the U.S., but they deliver uh, well over 20% of the care. And if you, if you, join, if you need a trauma center, a neonatal intensive care unit, a burn unit, the odds are good you're going to be in one of our hospitals. So we are deeply embedded in health care, and over the last century, especially over the last 50 years, and the growth of fee-for-service medicine, we have made the culture I described, the autonomous, independent, hierarchical, competitive culture, we have made that the culture of healthcare in the United States, too. So that's our cultural reality. Now, realities tend to intersect with one another, and I don't know uh, if you've uh, been hermetically sealed away from any media, uh, but unless you have, you know we have a political reality uh, going on in this country. So we're in another two-year election cycle, the way, the way our federal government works. And we started this cycle in uh, November, two years ago, with all of us, whether we were D's or R's or independents or Tea Party members, actually the, one of the most consistent polling findings was we wanted bipartisanship, right? We were so fed up with what we'd seen evolving, not, not just uh, in the two years before that, but actually you could argue for a decade or more before that, these deep partisan divisions that where, whoever you voted for, an underlying expectation was that they'd go to Washington and work in a bipartisan fashion. And we got it, and it lasted about two seconds. And, <laughs> and it was captured on film, you know. They, you, you didn't see the part where they actually wrestled for the gavel. But when John Boehner finally wrestled it away from Nancy Pelosi, you know, they did hug and make up. But then what happened? The next day, the newly elected House, feeling its oats, passed its measure to repeal the health care law. Now, it was going nowhere, but they made a statement. Uh, they actually made a statement even in the way they titled it. They didn't say to repl replace the Affordable Care Act. No, it was to replace the job-killing health care law. The lines got drawn again. Then we realized with the summer debacle that we had, a debt debacle, that we had a problem. We weren't addressing the underlying financial problems we faced, so we appointed a super committee. We and others relentlessly lobbied the staff and the members working on that super committee, and of course we got to Thanksgiving and it became labeled the super failure. We kicked the can down the road. Now, um, just this week, Congressman Ryan, who heads the House Budget Committee, issues a budget that it's even more deep in its partisan divisions. Believe it or not, if you look at the House budget, it essentially would lead to NIH cuts even deeper than those that would be triggered by the debt agreement made last summer. So fortunately, it's not law. The House, the House may pass it, but it certainly would never pass the Senate. But it just shows how the lines have been drawn. And so what are we hoping for? We're hoping that somebody here is going to get us out of this? 
you know, I was really hoping it would get a little more clear and I could Photoshop a couple people out of the right-hand picture. <laughs> uh, it, uh, so Kelly's working on actually making the right-hand one work like a calliope, so whoever appears more up or down each week, you know, could move. But seriously, do, do any of us believe that whoever comes out of this group as our next president is going to end the partisan divisions? There, there just are no indications that we're really close to that. So the political reality that, that I think we have to face in academic medicine is the folks we're electing are not proving to be active agents in solving our problems. Atul Grover, who's here somewhere today and who heads our public policy efforts, is frustrated because much of his time is spent playing defense. Instead of developing solutions, we're sending people constantly to the hill to keep them from doing things that would totally destabilize your home institution. That's the political reality. Now, this might be great theater. You know, we could just view this as some sort of real-life Monty Python skit going on on Capitol Hill if we didn't face another reality, which is our national economic reality. You know, if we were booming, if we were prospering, um, I guess we wouldn't need the government to resolve problems. But we just crossed a dangerous line. You know, we're at the point now where our total debt, that $15 trillion of debt, is surpassing our annual gross domestic product. Those are $100 bills, you know, the size of a football field and almost as high as the Statue of Liberty, uh, which are essentially, for those, just as a heartwarming fact for those many of you in the audience who are younger, uh, our plan, our current plan now, is to pass this on to you. Uh, that's my generation's solution. It's mounting, and it will be intergenerationally pushed downstream. This is a dangerous situation. If we didn't think it was, these are real developed nations, the nine European nations that were downgraded. Not just, they didn't just have their outlook turn negative, actually downgraded by S&P several weeks ago. Now, how does this start to get really, really close to us? There's a piece, that, those of you who've heard me talk before know I, I refer to this often because I just found it to be such a wonderful explanation of something I didn't fully understand. This fellow uh, who I ha I've had the pleasure of meeting with is Neil Hogan. Uh, he's a uh, doctoral uh, uh, economist, I believe, who works with BDC advisors this piece you can only pull off the internet, so if you Google the end of the third bubble, Neil Hogan, you'll get it. Um, and he explains in a very brief monograph uh, how bubbles work. Now, I don't know if anybody here was an economics major. I wasn't. And I didn't really understand bubbles. But, you know, there's been this phenomenon, as long as there's been commerce, in the civilized world, a phenomenon of certain things getting overvalued, overpriced. There was a tulip bubble, apparently, at one point in history where tulip bulbs became more precious than gold and got traded that way. There have been many land bubbles over the time. Well, he talks about three bubbles. Bubbles we know, and many of us lived through personally and painfully. The first bubble was the tech bubble. Ah, remember that one? You know. Every tech stock that went public went through the ceiling, and all the commentators would talk about there's no rational justification for the stock price being the way it is, but go ahead and buy more and more. And we know what happened there. It hurt. But we seem to pull out of it fairly rapidly. He makes the point that the way we pulled out of it was we built another bubble. And we called it our house equity. <laughs> And so the next bubble was the housing bubble and the banking bubble, the over-leveraged banks, underpinning it. I don't think anybody in this room feels like we've recovered from that one uh, at all. Um, so what's the third bubble? 
health care. And what he walks through is how the, the ultimate pricing dynamics of something being priced at excessively higher and higher levels, not justified by the product that's delivered, is the underpinning of a bubble. He talks about other dimensions of it. And he basically says, this is where American health care is. Now, uh, my colleagues who do such great research found something I'd never heard of called Gapminder. Uh, and it's this great website that can illustrate phenomena in a really compelling way. You're messaging experts, so you may like this site for various reasons. But uh, so the axis going up and down on the left, the y-axis, is the amount spent per capita on health care by a given nation. Um, the uh, uh, bottom axis is the income per person in each nation. So it reflects which are the richer nations going to the right. So the going up is spending more, going to the right uh, is being a richer nation. And the size of the bubble is the size of the population of the nation. Okay? So this is back in 1995, I believe. And guess which bubble seems to be ascending higher and higher away from the others. And now these data are four years old, four more years, and we'd be off the top of the slide. That's the U.S. You know, I, I loved the slide because it's a visual illustration of the third bubble inflating. Um, now, those of you who have great eyesight may notice there are two black dots up there with us. Uh, that is Monaco and Luxembourg. <laughs> two, seriously, two tax havens where nobody cares how much they spend for anything, you know? They might be able to s sustain this. We certainly can't. So we have an economic reality of health care cost being a key driver of unsustainable debt for us, and the United States leaving more and more the reality of the rest of the world. We have a political system that's gridlocked. Uh, so let's now focus, and we're involved in health care in a deep, deep way in our nation. So what is our health care reality? Now, there's an interesting comparison about this issue of how much we spend on health care. And uh, this came from an IOM study, that if other prices had grown as, quick, uh, as quickly as health care has since 1945, uh, a dozen eggs would cost what is that, $55? A dozen oranges would cost $134. Uh, I, I asked my, uh, my patient and helpful spouse if these were what they actually cost, and she told me it isn't. Uh, you know, another illustration of the bubble at work. But if we could sit here and say that because of us in academic medicine, you know, Twelve oranges today are pretty much the same as twelve oranges in 1945. But we could say, look, because of what we've accomplished, health care is so spectacularly good now, it's justified. Having it be the main driver of federal spending is justified. We could say that if the outcome was great. But what have we yielded nationally for that spending? What is our health care reality? The number of uninsured today in America, hopefully the Supreme Court allows the Affordable Care Act to expand insurance, but today the number of uninsured is equivalent to the total population of all those shaded states. A huge access problem that is not giving us value. And then there are our outcomes. I've been privileged to speak to academic medical groups in the UK, Japan, Singapore, uh, they ask me, how can we tolerate in our country the kind of outcomes we see compared to their countries and other developed nations around the world? 
you know, worst in obesity, fourth highest infant mortality. You, you combine the, these incredible costs together with lack of access, and we come up with phenomena like these that are a true source of national shame. So for all of the great medical advances that we have been, have been the drivers for over the last hundred years, we haven't produced a population result that we can be proud of. It actually should be a source of shame for us. So, um, this, this is the point when I talk to a group, I feel like I'm violating my oath as a psychiatrist because everybody's getting really depressed. <laughs> um, but I think we look at ourselves internally and there are some things we can do. And the first thing I think we need to do that you're so critical to is we need to rethink the image we're trying to portray. I was actually in a presentation not too long ago when uh, somebody showed this photo. They were talking about professionalism and what we're trying to do in our medical schools. And they said, they basically said, this is us. This is what we aspire to. This is this famous uh, draw, uh, portrait by Dr. Luke Files. Uh, and it just illustrates the image that I think we wish we portrayed in medicine of the totally caring, focused, concentrated, empathic physician there for a family, a child, at, at their hour of greatest need. Now, I don't think many Americans probably have even seen this. What they have seen is, is uh, this. House is not exactly the good doctor. Gray's Anatomy, uh, there's, uh, I, my two college-age daughters have been great Gray's Anatomy fans. I can't stand to watch it because of the repeated ethical violations. <laughs> and yet this is feeding the public's perception about what's going on. You know, so they see these TV images, and we might say, well, they know that's fiction. They, they, don't, um, uh, uh, they don't think that that's really what's going on in our institutions, our academic centers. But then they see things that aren't fiction. They see headlines. They see reports. Now, we can talk about how these reports are distorted, but they see reports that our institutions fall low on certain quality outcome measures. They see evidence of us doing unnecessary treatments. This isn't fiction. And the more well-read among them see these things repeatedly. And then they drive by the campus, and they don't see caring doctors at the bedside. They see cranes everywhere at a time when they can't sell their house to cover their mortgage. They see a building boom going on on our campuses. Now I, I have the toughest time when I go to Capitol Hill because it's inevitable that in many of those conversations the senator or congressman will say, you know, you guys are telling me how worried you are about NIH. What are all those cranes I see on your campus about? And then Elisa Siegel and, and her team do public opinion surveys and we try to focus them. We say, okay, look past the cranes and look past House and Gray's Anatomy. What do you really think of us? How do you feel about our graduates from medical school? Well, they feel pretty good, actually, uh, about the medical knowledge that we give our graduates. But when you ask them how they feel about bedside manner, which I think is really a surrogate for professionalism, for how caring is that person at, in the clinic room or at the bedside, they don't feel so good. We get much, much lower marks from the public. And then you might say, okay, the public, they get these distorted images. They just don't know uh, how good and well-intentioned we are and how well we work. What do we think internally? Are we living up to our own expectations? No, we're, we have our own doubts. Some of you may have heard this phrase, the informal curriculum. 
This was really a seminal paper that, that uh, a group of colleagues uh, put together from an AMC working group now about a decade ago, 15 years ago, where we finally admitted that I could stand up, as I did, in a medical school lecture hall and talk about the principles of medical ethics. But if the student then went on a third-year clerkship and saw a surgeon throw an instrument or a, saw a radiologist throw a fit or saw a psychiatrist speak demeaningly of a patient once they'd left the room, that's the informal curriculum. And we began to have worries that much of what we were trying to teach, that image of the good doctor that Sir Luke painted, isn't carried out in the way we were behaving day to day. And then, even more chillingly, we started looking at the issue of conflicts of interest that so many of you have had to wrestle with in your messaging. This is Jerry Kassir's famous book. And that photo uh, breaks my heart because it captures the cover of the book and the photo he put on it captures the dilemma that have we become so tied up in our financial interest that we are actually on the take in various ways, meaning not working in the patient's interest. This is a well-respected member of our own community who raised these questions for us. So what are we going to do about this? Uh, I have a relentless belief that we can prevail. But I'm trying to be very clear-headed about these realities so that we know what pathways we actually need to take. I want us to be turning every one of those applicants that we're accepting now this spring into good doctors. Well, <clears throat> as I said in my annual meeting speech in Denver last fall, I think the only way we can do it is to sit down and really reflect on what we consider our excellence to be. Um, I got some interesting feedback, some positive, some negative, about some things I've said in that speech, but I stand by them. If we don't realize that that painting of the good doctor was an era that we'll never see again, he was concerned, but he was also powerless to do anything, really, to help that child. We have enormous power, but as the photo on the right illustrates, it almost tends to distance us from our patients, make us look almost like science fiction, high-tech, non-human characters. So how do we find a way of expressing excellence that can deal with the high-tech world we've entered, but really connect with all those audiences that you try so hard to connect to? Well, part of the problem is I think we've got to stop judging excellence the way we have been. Uh, we have all been unindicted co-conspirators in supporting the rankings. You know, these are your ra a random selection of your websites. Your names have been blurred to, pro <laughs> to protect the guilty. You know who you are, and you know how much it costs to be able to use the U.S. News and World Report badge. Uh, on your publications and your website. And we also know, and we're intelligent people, we know how fundamentally flawed those rankings are. This was a wonderful piece by Malcolm Gladwell in The New Yorker a few months back. And he, he showed how the rankings are ridiculous by looking at law schools and how by just switching a few variables or creating new variables, you totally turn the rankings around but we're a nation obsessed with rankings and top 10 lists. And we play along with it, right? So um, I see some of us now willing to rethink this. In a few days, the Council of Deans is meeting, and an item on their agenda is to talk about the rankings. And is there a possibility that medical schools as a group could say, no, we're not playing along? That would essentially undermine the ability of an outside organization to arbitrarily pick a few variables and judge us. That will be, I assure you, a very interesting discussion. <laughs>
Um, you can each feel free to ask your dean when they get back home where they got in that discussion. Uh, they, they actually, a group of deans held a meeting with the editors from U.S. News and World Report and, and roundly criticized the rankings. Now, U.S. News and World Report doesn't want to give up its number one revenue source, so they just said, well, you give us the right variables, right? Which, of course, immediately pits research-intensive schools versus community-based schools uh, and is not the way I want to see us defining excellence. I would like to see us actually amplify what you're doing across the country. These are all the states I've been privileged to visit. I know I haven't visited every one of your campuses, but I actually at this point have been on the majority of them, as well as speaking to, to groups of all kinds around the country. I get to see the excellence on your campuses because you're proud of it and you want to show it to me. And it's typically not the kind of thing that shows up in U.S. News and World Report rankings. It's a different kind of engagement. I wrote about this after the annual meeting in a reporter column. You can pull back up on the website. But the gist of it is I think we're going through a major change in the way we view ourselves. Um, you know, I, talk, I still talk to search committees who are looking for deans and vice presidents for health sciences. I was on the phone yesterday with the university president. And many of them are still caught. They say, well, we'd like to get somebody who would move us up the NIH rankings. Or we know we need to have better MCAT scores to do better in the US News and World Report. You know, so they're even caught up in, in these items on the left. Are those readable in the back so that I don't need to torture you by reading slides to you? I would argue that those are converting, and we need to push that conversion to a focus on the things on the right. You know, what does your mission statement actually say? You know, I have yet to see one of your mission statements that reads, our goal is to recruit only students with MCATs above 32 who will succeed no matter what we do to them so that our faculty don't have to teach and can pursue writing research grants so that we can climb the ladder of NIH funding. That's not, not what you committed to. So to the degree we can start to actually focus our efforts on these things on the right, on a holistic admissions process that actually looks as much for empathy as it does for academic accomplishment. Uh, not on how, how much our hospital has earned, how many admissions we've had, but how many people we've kept out of the hospital. Hard to measure in the current world, but wouldn't that be a better index of excellence than where we've been? So when I talked with Nicole and Chris about, about this presentation, they said you're a very action-oriented group. And you don't just want platitudinous aspirations. You want it to, to really talk nuts and bolts about what are the changes that we need to make. And I think those changes will also some create a new kind of story for you to be telling. Not that you won't still highlight the kinds of things I saw recognized in the awards ceremony last night, but I think they may generate other kinds of stories that will help convey what we're trying to do in, in achieving these, this new excellence. Now, this is an arbitrary list. I could have made a list of 20 things, but I tried to pick five things that I think are sort of core anchors, and then we can, in the discussion, build out from that. The first is the way we work together as people. Um, we are not going to get there if it's every man, every woman for himself and herself, if it's all about individual achievement, if it's leave me alone so I can uh, do more surgeries or write more papers, uh, if it's all about individuals each pursuing their own thing. I think that healthcare and academic medicine are struggling with this transition, but it has to happen, the transition to really working as teams. 
This is an old book now. It's probably 15 years old. But still, uh, Katzenbach and Smith are viewed as the clearest proponents of how teams truly work, uh, of what makes a team, what makes it succeed. There's a great illustration in their book of, uh, that shows how hard the process is and I think explains why we don't use teams more. Now, um, most of you, I would argue, on your campus, if you looked at the whole Academic Health Center, you probably have a couple of committees, right? You have hundreds of committees. But what Katzenbach and Smith would assert is they're not teams, even if they call themselves that. Most of them aren't. They're working groups. And those working groups, illustrated by those boxes, uh, for me it was captured when one department chair uh, would, had the best attendance at chair's meetings, but would bring work and sit there and do the work through the chair's meetings and rarely contribute, but it was always there. And I finally just couldn't help it anymore. And I said, why? <laughs> if you're not going to participate, why do, you, why do you come to the meetings? And he said, I'm here to make sure nobody does anything bad to my department. And if you think about it, that's individualism at its core, right? It's about me, my group, not about us. What Katzenbach and Smith assert in overly simplified terms is when you start to break that down, when you start to assume that we're mutually accountable to one another, that my resources can support you and vice versa, all heck breaks loose. And actually your performance goes down. And everybody starts saying, I knew this was a bad idea. And then when you have the tough conversations and you get through that, you start to performing higher and higher and soon you realize that as a team, you attain higher levels of performance than was ever possible when you were a committee or a working group. Uh, this is something we've been working very hard on internally at the AMC. Um, this is something I did as dean and I've counseled a number of deans to do. You can run an entire academic health center with eight teams. You have a team for each of the missions. Now, the first battle, of course, is you, you have to convince the chairs that it's going to work even if they don't sit on every team. The trick to doing that is all the teams meet at the same time each week. <laughs> but think about this. I'm, I'm, I'm deadly serious. Suddenly, you learn how to trust other people to take the point on certain issues. Now, for your purposes, uh, I wanted to highlight the team at the bottom because it became, in many ways, the strongest, most effective team on our campus. Jen Schlenner, who now I'm privileged to work with as our chief of staff at the AMC, can tell you more about this team. Uh, it's the strategic relations team. It's the GIA. It's the people who communicate the message to government, to alumni, to donors in marketing, in public affairs. In some places, you don't talk to each other. Or if you do so, it's rare, or if you have a conflict. The strategic relations team was, was formed to do what all those other teams, to in a, in a broad, bring together broad perspectives in the team and in a mutually accountable way, take on the big opportunities, fix the big problems. So changing the way we work as people is number one. Number two is getting out of our financial murkiness. We have, we have precious resources. The average medical school, not including the teaching hospital, budget is now approaching a half billion dollars a year. That's a lot of money. And we have, as not-for-profit institutions, a stewardship obligation about that. I, I want to see a show of hands. How many of you have a perfect understanding of the funds flow in your academic medical center? <laughs> <coughs> of course you don't. You, know, you may know your pie chart. The AMC puts it together, takes your data, and shows you how it works. This is the pie chart for the average medical school. You have this sense 
that by virtue of those two biggest wedges on the right and then the big blue wedge, that you're very dependent on clinical earnings and also very dependent to greater or lesser degrees on research earnings. Tuition is a mere sliver. And you know that somehow this all gets mixed up and runs the place. But you can't figure out how. Nobody can figure out how. It's the cauldron. Okay? So dollars come in for hospital payments or grants or tuition or state appropriation. And theoretically, they should all be very clearly and transparently allocated out to pay clinicians, teachers, researchers. Instead, for the chairs, for the faculty, sometimes even the dean, nobody can figure out how it all works. It gets mixed together in the cauldron. And the biggest problem is, in their frustration, everybody concludes that somebody else has been skimming off to the right <laughs> into a discretionary fund. We have to suddenly start thinking about these things, not as, let's just try to get more dollars in, put them in the cauldron, and hope they support everything on the other end. We have to start thinking about our work, not just in terms of what our margin is, the financial performance on the bottom, but the actual mission contribution. Ideally, we want to do a lot of things that are in that upper right-hand box that allow us to, to work with a positive margin while fully meeting our missions. But, arguably, we should be doing a lot of things in that upper right-hand box. Some of the community service efforts that you talk about in your messaging would fall in that box. I fear that a lot of us in academic medical centers are caught up in the lower right-hand box, pursuing the revenue and falling adrift from the mission. You know, I was a health system CEO twice over. Um, the best way for us to generate a high margin as a medical center was for lots of people to get really, really sick. That was not our mission statement, you know. <laughs> Seriously, to hope that lots of people got really, really ill. We've got to change to a model in which the reward comes for keeping people well and out of the hospital. That is transformational change in the way we view our resources. The third, and I think this session that you've done in recent years on leadership speaks to it, is we've got to grow some leaders. We are in desperate need of leadership. When I, when I poll a faculty group I'm talking to and ask them what the biggest problem is, they almost always say money. There's not enough money. My diagnosis is there's not enough leadership. Now, there are people with titles everywhere. We love titles. You know, you're, you're not doing well unless you have three or four titles, right, in academic medicine. But what, what we actually need are people who can lead change. Uh, this is, is if, if I had to, s and, and have actually tell people, and they say, well, what should I read about leadership? This is actually the book. Uh, that I found most valuable. Again, it's, it's fairly old, but it's a classic. It's James O'Toole's book on leading change. He has a great illustration in the book. I don't know how many of you have been to the Getty Museum um, in Los Angeles, but the largest work of art in there, it covers a whole wall, is this painting. And it's a painting by uh, uh, James Enser, an artist in Belgium in the late 1800s. And the title of the painting is Christ Entry into Brussels, 1889. Now, what he was trying to illustrate was what society had become and how hard it was to be a leader, even if you were Christ. Um, if you actually see the painting itself, you, you ultimately can figure out that Christ is somewhere in the middle of this procession, barely visible, uh, but there are all sorts of disparate groups marching bands, clowns, everything, uh, socialists, there's a socialist band. There are all these different groups. And he uses the painting to illustrate that the leader's job now isn't to say, I'm the most accomplished, I had the most grants, you know, I'm the most well-known, therefore I should be the dean or the chair and you should follow me and wait for me to bestow my vision on you. 
that the task of leadership now is for people who can stand in the middle of this cacophony of different forces and actually help people move in a single direction. This is uh, illustrated, again, I hope you can, can read that. I don't want to read it to you. But these are the kinds of properties. And these slides will, will be on the website, right, for the GIA. So they'll, they'll all be available to you. But traditionally, this was the person who became, on the left, the person who became the chair, the dean, the institute director. Um, they were what you would call transactional leaders. They knew how to go out and recruit a faculty member, submit a budget to build five more programs, and so on. What we need now are transformational leaders. And the characteristics of those kinds of leaders are listed on the right. There are not many people in our institutions, because most of them, like me, grew up in the left-hand world. There are not many people prepared to do that. That is why I think one of the best investments you're making are the leadership academies, institutes, internal programs that many of you are putting in place. It's why we're focusing very much as the AMC on how we can rethink our leadership development offerings to create more of these transformational leaders. The fourth thing then kind of wraps these together to say, let's talk about culture. Let's admit that we grew up in this culture that I mentioned earlier. But instead of just alluding to it obliquely in a value statement that we post on the wall but don't look at very much, let's actually explicitly in our discussions talk about a culture like the one on the right, one that uses teams, one that's very accountable about resources. And let's question decisions in meetings about whether we're promoting the culture on the right. You know, if, if um, as a dean, if I allow a faculty member who's famously abusive to colleagues but is a huge revenue generator, if I allow them to continue working in our environment unchallenged about their behavior, I have no hope of convincing people that I want the culture on the right. It's that simple. You have to talk about culture and you have to translate it into real decisions. Now, that brings me to the last point, which is uh, one that comes up especially sadly when I talk to physician groups. We get to this point, the question, answers, discussion, and somebody says, you know, uh, that's very interesting what you just said, but this is all a matter of politics. Would you please just go back to Washington and get us more money? And uh, then everything would be fine. You know, get the NIH budget back on an upward trend, you know, get this Medicare business resolved so that we continue to be the best paid services and so on. And I have to bring them back to say, no, it's not just a matter of politics. One of my areas of academic interest over the years actually was in ethics. Um, I think part of the reason I actually went to medical school, chose medicine ultimately, one of the reasons was that the most interesting undergraduate course I took was an ethics course. I was a philosophy major. You had to take ethics. And I loved it because of its simplicity. And in clinical ethics, it is about as simple as anything you'll encounter in medicine. There are only four principles. Doing good, beneficence. Doing no harm, non-maleficence. Autonomy, respecting the patient's autonomy. Guess what the fourth one is? Social justice. So my point to those docs who push back is, wait a minute, you committed to clinical ethics. And as we've just seen, by looking at the realities of our nation, we have created an unjust, as well as financially unsustainable health care system. We, it isn't a political matter of just, just a political matter of fixing that. It's a professional, ethical obligation to fix that. So the reason I include this on the list is we need something to emotionally drive us. 
And I would argue that there are few things as powerful as an ethical obligation to drive the professionals that we all aspire to be. So I encourage you to talk not just about culture, but to talk about the values, the ethics that underline and drive it in every one of your discussions. If we do this, I see signs, I see, you know, they talk about green shoots in the recovering economy. I see green shoots of the new excellence in academic medicine on every campus I visit. The problem is now they still look more like the exception than the rule. You know, my mission with you, with my uh, council of deans, with all of us, is we've got to amplify those green shoots so that they become the message. They don't just become interesting, charitable things our students did or a faculty group did on a mission, but they become core and central to what we are. Thank you. Okay, if you don't stop me, I will say these things again. So what I need from you, you are the experts. I never speak to a group that has so much wisdom and experience around the message. I've outlined what I think are the components of the message. I'd love to hear your thoughts about how we can communicate these things better to our colleagues. And who better to start the discussion than someone who was a personal mentor for me, uh, dean, former dean at the University of Kentucky, Emory Wilson. <laughs> I'm, I'm being especially nice to Emory because my UNC Tar Heels are going to beat his Wildcats. <laughs> Uh, just because Dr. Kirsch is president of the AAMC, everyone thinks he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> uh, but but I, I just wanted to tell everyone, too, that uh, he really does walk the walk because um, he, I think, maybe was one of the first to really implement team uh, administration and, and the team approach. Uh, to running a uh, medical school and an academic health center, certainly when he was at Penn State uh, and before, before the Institute of Medicine and everyone else started talking about teams. Um, in the Good to Great book, Jim Collins talks about uh, a, a culture of discipline, that in order for the good companies to become great companies, there had to have been a culture of discipline that everyone knew what had to be done. Uh, universities have no discipline. That, uh, the faculty, uh, there, there is no discipline among faculty, uh, more so among staff, I think, but, but that's why we have so many regulations. I mean, what other organization, maybe except the federal government, has as many regulations as a university system? Uh, and yet, w we have the opportunity with some of the new medical schools coming up of introducing new systems. Uh, and yet they seem to be pretty much falling in line with all the others, partly maybe because of LCME uh, regulations, standards, and so forth. So how, how can we get out of this uh, mire of, um, of the regulations and, and, and the other things? I mean, it, it does require the transformational leadership, but where do we start? The... Um you know, I've been intrigued. I, I talked to so many newly appointed deans and vice presidents for health sciences. And I can tell you the, what I believe is the wrong place to start. Uh, almost all of them say uh, they're chomping at the bit to get working on a strategic plan. And they appoint committees to generate the strategic plan. Um, you know, and, and then I see the products, and there might as well be a software program called Strategic Plans R Us, you know, that had uh, top 10 in NIH funding by 2020. You know, uh, certain aspirations that just always seem to almost automatically fall out of those exercises. Uh, 
And I, th I actually have urged people to start with culture. Uh, you know, the, an illustration of this is that the AMC, you may or may not know, we collect impeccable annual data on faculty salaries. And surprise, surprise, that's our best-selling publication. We have very, very little data on organizational culture. You know, so I, what I advise is for people to spend a lot of time really making an honest appraisal of, of how is the culture? How much teamwork do we illustrate now? Where does it occur? Uh, that a lot, of, a lot of momentum gets built out of that kind of reflection. Uh, seeing what dissatisfies people, where they are satisfied. Uh, I also think that sometimes we hide behind the regulations. I know you and I both served on the LCME. But I think the LCME, for instance, is much more permissive than we like to admit at times. Sometimes we like somebody to just give us a blueprint and then we'll follow it because that actually is simpler than innovating, than doing the hard work of innovation. So I think the best leaders, whether you're leading a strategic relations team, uh, or a development office, or a medical school, or a medical center, uh, that spending some time saying, you know, what are our values? What is our culture right now? And then working toward what kind of culture do we aspire to build? It's amazing for me how um, if you do that, then people begin to, I think, acknowledge that we need to work in different ways. That paves the way for developing teams. And I think teams are necessary to really create innovations. True innovation now is, in organizations as complicated as ours, requires a lot of heads coming together. So we've been do we're doing a lot of innovation work within the AMC now, and it generally is being generated by cross-disciplinary groups of teams who've come together. So, you know, this, sound, this is overly simplistic, but if I have an elevator ride with the dean and they're saying, where should I start? I say, attention to culture. <laughs> you know, focus on creating teams and focus those teams on creating innovation. And, and read your mission statement every now and then to remind yourself what you committed to do. Yes, sir. And if you'd say who you are, so folks. Uh, Barry Collins, University of Virginia. Um, you know, you talk about culture and how deans can change the culture. Um, a lot of the feedback that I get, though, is how can a dean change culture when the chairs know that the average life of a dean is five years or less, and they're on a term. They have a, they have a term of five years, and then it's renewed possibly by their Board of Visitors, Board of Regents. How can a dean impact that when, you know, the chairs of the departments and everything realize that you know, it's just a matter of time that they can outlast them. <laughs> um, most chairs serve at the pleasure of the dean. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that is a reality. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm just going to be very candid with you. Uh, uh, I was dean total in total for almost 14 years. And, um, the first conversation I would have with the chair as dean is saying, you know, here's our mission statement. Here's what we're committed to. It's going to require big change. You didn't sign up for big change. How do you feel about that? Mm -hmm. It's amazing how many of them actually rise to the occasion. And I was surprised in many cases by how many of them said, you mean, you mean my option isn't just to sit here, fold my arms, and try and wait you out? You know, we actually could do some things differently here. Uh, in other cases, they say, I didn't sign up for this. You know, you're right. And I say, well, what do you really enjoy doing? What do you want to do? And I've worked with many deans who didn't want to engage in that change to segue out of it. But uh, the, the situation you describe, where you have a, a a dean who's feeling tenuous, the actual tenure, if you take out interim deans, the actual tenure is six years going towards seven for private medical schools, which is pretty decent. But 
if the dean comes in feeling timid about just trying to, to preserve their longevity in the job and doesn't feel prepared to have honest discussions with the chairs, nothing is going to happen. But if you have those honest discussions with the chairs, many times what it empowers them to do is to have those same discussions with their chat section chiefs. And you can create the momentum. I don't think that's a Pollyannish view because I've done that in two different medical schools. And, um, you know, in honesty, probably 30% of the chairs honestly said to me they didn't sign up for it and we worked out a transition. Um, most agreed to give it a try. Some couldn't stick with it and found it frustrating and, and did other things. But a lot of them finally attained a level of working as an organization. I don't think it's much fun to be a chair when you feel your job is to fight off other chairs to preserve your, t you know, what kind of grad job gratification is that? So it actually can create a lot of gratification for them too as a group. Uh, the chair's job is a tough one. You know, for them, they have the section chiefs as an issue. Thank you. Can I, Steve, before we go that, you know, some of you do have a problem. When you look at the AMC data about deans, some of your institutions seem to chew up deans. And that is a real concern. And in fact, in a couple cases, I've actually talked with the university presidents about how destructive I think that is when you have this super high turnover. Um, there is one medical school, you know who you are, and I think since, since World War II, you've had 40 deans. Steve? Darrell, um, first of all, thanks for the um, uh, culture and transformational change uh, talk. And I think one of the great things, AAMC under your leadership has lived that, even the folks below you. I'd like you to talk to you a little bit about pace, though, because transformation requires a pace that we haven't been used to, and frankly, the AAMC hasn't been used to. So the MedCat change, for example, is, is just great in embodying some of the changes. But if we're going to start accepting students based on emotional intelligence and empathy and more Marcus Welby-ish type skills, one of the questions I'd like to ask you is what are some of the AAMC changes? So for example, you know the program that we've done around erasing some of the objective criteria and looking at emotional intelligence. But then you run into the USMLE roadblock. And are the USMLEs between the second and third year, for example, the only way of assessing if yeah. somebody should move on? And so true transformation probably is going to require uh, all of us, both as deans and folks in AAMC, looking in the mirror and saying, what do we need to do to make that easier? And I'd love to get your comments on that. Well, it's going to mean um, working. You know, we've kind of all operated in our own silos. So for example, the national board, which controls the USMLE, uh, and the ACGME around residencies. This whole alphabet soup of organizations is now starting to have conversations in which we admit we're part of the problem. We've sort of fragmented up our world, hyper-regulated it, and immobilized people when it comes to innovation in many cases. And so there's much more crosstalk going on. I've become much more, I think, one of our biggest obstacles, I know I'm going to get in trouble for saying this, sorry, Elisa. The universities don't get it at all. I, I mean, in general, the, the universities and colleges are still saying, we're the academy, we're different, you know, none of these things apply to us. And so I've become much more involved. I just went on the board of the American Council of Education. Uh, have spoken to the AAU presidents and other presidents to help the, them understand that what academic medicine is working on right now, they've got to get engaged in too because they're at risk. Um, you bring up another issue though. How many of you, let's just do a straw poll here. How many of you think the, the faculty and staff on your campus believe we are in an urgent situation that the platform is, is burning? How many of you think we can probably ride this thing out at least until I retire? <laughs> but that is part of the problem. I think 
the other thing, Steve, is that a lot of our colleagues don't feel a sense of urgency. There was just a survey done of your principal business officers. This stunned me. This is being discussed with the deans, too. They asked the business officers for the medical schools, uh, what do you believe your financial situation will be as a school three to five years from now? So they asked them what they thought the threats were, and they went through it. You know, NIH funding going down, Medicare and Medicaid being uh, condensed, state funding going away. They listed correctly all the challenges. Then they asked them, what do you think your financial situation will be as a school three to five years from now? Seventy percent of them said, as good or better. What have they been smoking? <laughs> I mean, the dissonance of that is deafening, right? that they know what the challenges are, but can actually say, but we're going to be fine, we're going to be better. So part of our messaging job is to say, it isn't just to say our institutions are at risk, it's part of the reason I started this talk the way I did. Our country is at risk right now. The combination of our, our financial situation, our structural debt as our nation, our political paralysis in dealing with it, and the fact that health care costs are at the epicenter of it all is a national emergency. And so part of our messaging has to be to get people to be able to see the reality in front of them, to not be, you know, uh, Pollyannish in their expectations the way surprisingly many of the business officers seem to be. Last question or answer. I like answers better than questions. <laughs> I have no answers. Um, my name is Marin Shokir. I'm actually not a member of this group. Uh, my husband and I are here giving a presentation this afternoon. And um, actually the work that we do at the risk of sounding self-serving is exactly what you laid out in your talk today. And we work with a lot of healthcare organizations and with educational institutions, including your home, stump, your home ground of Penn State. The question I had, we've been doing some work there, and one of the things that we keep hearing about is that the education costs are rising, escalating even faster than health care. And since the AAMC is sort of at the intersection of those two costs, and, and it was interesting to me that you said only 3% of the budgets are from tuition. I'm curious what your take is on, on that sort of other bubble that's rising but doesn't get talked about much. Well, it, it's... Uh, I mean, the, the bubble of higher education cost is it's per personally very worrisome to me. I mean, we're privatizing public higher education in the United States, which means we're, we're taking access away from people. I'm not trying to minimize that as a situation uh, that needs to be dealt with or our role, our obligation. I mean, we repeatedly are having discussions among the deans about what steps we might take or positions we might take to control medical school tuition growth. But the problem, uh, as I see it, is uh, health care costs are much more central to our national plight. You know, so for the states now, their biggest item used to be education support. Now the biggest state budget item is Medicaid. And you read the headlines about what your own state is thinking about Medicaid. They're all trying to figure out how to get out from under the burden of that cost. So I don't want to minimize higher ed cost, but I, I think we need to admit we're deeply involved in health care, and health care and its cost and its poor outcomes in this country are stand at the epicenter of our national crisis now, our national financial crisis. You've been very gracious. I hope you continue to have a good meeting. And uh, thank you. Thank you for everything you did.